Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. All right. I want to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're super excited to be able to introduce and bring to you a virtual workshop that focuses on college planning and funding. I am Dr. Christy Murray, and I will be facilitating this discussion today and um, just really happy to meet everyone. Um, and we're going to just jump right in and get started. Um, before we get started, I want to turn it over to uh, Ms. Waller to see if she has any opening remarks. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you for uh, attending this workshop to this evening. When you get a chance, please check the chat box for the participation link for attendance for this evening. When you complete that form, you enter in a chance to win a workbook and textbook from tonight's webinar. Thank you. Yes, You're thank you. All right, well, thank you all. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in and get started. And if technology works well, I'm gonna kick it off with a video. Be trusted with money and wealth. Listen to me, y'all. I had a teacher in eighth grade tell me I was a high school material. And I believe that they actually set my mom down and was like, yo, your son not even gonna make it, so you should just go ahead and like wrap it up like I, I can't I can't legally leave him behind again but I think you should probably go ahead and just sign him up for this special ed course my mom was like no nope, no nope. and you know what I did I went into the ninth grade with that mentality and I failed I actually I got kicked out of one high school then I went to another high school said okay I'm gonna try my ninth grade year one more time failed failed out of that one went to the third I went to three different schools just to get my act together in the ninth grade and I said man I'm proving all these people right who don't believe in me, and my mama and a few people who do believe in me, I'm proving them wrong. Like, let me stop playing my people. Because when I play my people, I'm playing myself. And so some of y'all, you think it's cool to disrupt class. Man, you playing yourself and you playing your people. Because there's people back in the day that got uh, uh, burnt and beat and spit on and dog sick and water holes to get an equal education. And we come to school looking how we look, all clean and fresh, and we think it's a game, but people died for this. So I'm at a place in life now, I'm like, yo, I ain't trying to take back, I'm trying to give back now. Listen to me, y'all, and I started to grow level by level by level by level. And after I finally got my act together in high school, I took summer school courses. Some of y'all about to put the work in. I took summer school, I took night courses, you know what I'm saying? I graduated on time from high school, and I said, shoot, if I could do high school, maybe it's something to this college thing. Let me tell y'all something right now, you going to college. Like, there ain't no, there ain't no if or, don't worry about fast for student loans, you going to college. But you got a program inside your brain, now you going. Like, there can't be no doubt. And so for me, I said, bump it. If I could do high school, shoot, I'm going to college. I did college, got that bachelor's degree in social work. I said, well, shoot, if I could get my bachelor's, maybe I could get my master's. If I could write one book, maybe I could write two books, then three books, then four books. Listen to me, there ain't nothing you can't do. And just because your parents might not have planned for you, there is a plan for your life, my friends. But what you gotta know, what you gotta know is that you deserve it. The problem with most people is they feel like, man, I don't really deserve it, you know, I made some mistakes, or this is all I know. This ain't all you know no more. I talk to so many folk. We've been to every major city in the hood, in the suburbs, all over the country, you know what I'm saying? And we meet a lot of people, they feel like, well, because my mama didn't experience it, my daddy, you can be the first. You can be the first in your family to experience these things. You can be the first in your family to gain it. I think about my three-year-old daughter now. I'm like, for one, she gonna have scholarships to go to college. And for two, we gonna already have that bread saved up just in case something go wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like me and my wife, we built, our, we ain't just buy a house, y'all. We built a house. My girl got to choose what type of hardwood floor she wanted, what type of granite counter she wanted. You know what I'm saying? We got to build that in our 30s. My daughter, I promise you, her credit gonna be so far. You know what I'm saying? She gonna be on a whole nother level because I'm, inst I'm creating a new culture. I'm, inst I'm instilling that in my daughter now. And I'm telling y'all, you could do the same thing. Hey, what's up? So I love kicking off my talks with families, with students by sharing trusted with someone money. else's story and how they got 
or made the progress on their journey that they ultimately were able to. And really, it just serves as a reminder that we all might come from different uh, family backgrounds, different eco eco economical statuses, et cetera, but you don't have to let your situation dictate what your future can be. So depending on where you are um, throughout this workshop today, I want you to think about what you want to have happen or what do you want to see for your future? Um, I was brought on and I'm happy to be here to talk about college planning and college funding. So in today's workshop, I certainly want to make sure that I share impactful information on how to get through the college admissions process, how to create a plan that can help jumpstart what you do next from an education and career standpoint. I also want to talk about the true parts and he touched on it in his video. He talked about scholarships. His daughter was going to get scholarships and if not, he and his wife had money set aside. That may or may not be your reality having money set aside, but Dr. Christie will share with you some key strategies that will help you to be able to navigate that whole college funding process, find scholarships, and fully fund your education without going broke, ideally. And I also want to talk about and raise awareness of historically Black colleges and universities. I'm the proud um, graduate of an HBCU, and I always make that up as a part of my conversation with um, students and parents. But ultimately, my goal is to make sure that each one of you, you get equipped with enough information to get accepted into college and equally important, graduate debt free. So if that sounds good to you, listen up, stay on this journey. We're going to cover some key things at any point throughout the discussion today. Um, come off of mute since we have a smaller group, which I absolutely love. Um, feel free to ask me questions, raise your hand, um, and we'll answer your questions um, to the extent that we can uh, throughout the, the talk. Um, really, I'm in this space to make sure that we help to close the gap. So when you think about, um, and let me know in the chat, um, if you can let me know if you are a parent or a student, and if so, what grade are you in or your student in? that brings you to this space tonight. That'll help me to be able to tailor our conversation. So if you're in high school, um, looking you know, to learn more about the college admissions process, let me know in the chat. Um, or if you are a parent of a student who's about or currently going through this process, just let me know in the chat if you're a student or parent and what your grade level is, that would be very helpful. So as you do that, um, I generally love talking to high school students who are thinking about what's next, what's life after high school look like? And so what I'm gonna be sharing with you, we're gonna talk a little bit about careers and college planning in the first part of the talk. And then in the second part, we're gonna talk about the college funding pieces. But the, the whole goal is to close the gap so that you walk away with just as enough information to be powerful and dangerous and feel like you have enough information to really feel confident about what you're gonna do next to prepare for life after high school. So good, so one, okay. Also, we have a parent and a doctorate student. So, okay, Miss Powell, that's great. Um, okay, we have another adult student, five classes away from an associate's degree. Congratulations, Miss Benita. And um, I would highly encourage you to continue on if that's your uh, desire to get your bachelor's degree. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about bridging that transition between the two there's some great programs that are designed to help do that and so if any others um you want to share what grade you're in or what your um career and college aspirations are what you currently have underway that would be fantastic so i want to know what's your why and it's starting to come out a little bit in just the comments i received so far parent doctorate student working on an associate's, maybe a bachelor's degree. So it sounds like education is important for you. So I want you to think about as we go through this workshop, why are you here in this workshop? And I think it's really great that the Housing Opportunity Commission is hosting this workshop because they wanna make sure that their residents get great information so that you can um, impact your career opportunities and really maximize what they can look like. So I am here to help you to do that. And so one of the things I wanna share, I wanna share my why. And so some of the things I share with you all will be based on whether you are in high school, transitioning to college, currently in college, or working on graduate, um, a graduate degree, 
a lot of these strategies will still be able to help you in many ways. And you might also have other family members who are not on this talk today in high school or in college who you think this information could be helpful for. But I'm gonna quickly share my why. I work in this space because I appreciated the help I had when I was in high school 31 years ago. I know I don't look at y'all, but 31 years ago, I was a high school senior, youngest of three girls. I have a set of older twin sisters and I had gone on all these college tours and I came home and I told my parents, I said, I know where I want to go to school. I want to go to the Hampton University and I want to major in electrical engineering. And my mother looked at me and was like, that's great. But Hampton's a private school, it's expensive. You're gonna have to pick a school that's more affordable like a public school or a state public school. Well, I didn't really wanna to go to any other school. I'd really fallen in love with Hampton, the campus, everything about my home by the sea. And so my mother and I went back and forth on it and she finally said, hey, look, if you wanna to go to Hampton, you're gonna to have to find some additional funds, scholarships or grants, something that's gonna help offset their tuition. Senior year. I worked hard, I had essays, I had letters of recommendation already pre-staged and pre-ready to go because I watched my sisters do it uh, with my parents' help years before. And so I had everything pre-staged and I would talk to whoever would listen. And I would say, hey, I wanna go to college, I wanna go to Hampton, I wanna major in engineering, you know? And one day I must've shared it with my school counselor. Um, because fast forward, she came and pulled me out of a class one day and she said, Christy, I have the scholarship from this comp corporation and they're looking for a student who wants to go to Hampton University and who's interested in majoring in engineering. And I thought that was just God's intuition and divine uh, intuition and intervention in my life. And she said, are you interested? And I said, absolutely. She said, but there's one caveat. You must have your application postmarked in two days or by tomorrow. It was like within the next 24, 48 hours. And she said, can you make that happen? And I looked at my school counselor and I said, the better question is, can you get my transcripts out that quick? And she smiled because, you know, if you know anything about a high school or for the uh, college students that are on tonight, getting transcripts is not as easy as it seems. So making sure that you can get your transcripts by the deadline is another matter. And she said, yes, I'll make sure we get your transcript sent out. She did her part. I went home, I pulled up that application. I pulled those letters of recommendation, those essays I had pre-written for other things, repurposed them, that's a gem. And I got that application in the mail. What I didn't realize is that I would have to interview twice for this scholarship. I'm a high school senior back in the late 19, well, 1993. We didn't, I didn't know anything about interviewing. There's nowhere for me to Google. We didn't even have the internet yet. So I had to go to the library, check out a book, figure out how to interview. I made it through two rounds of interviews, y'all, and ended up getting that scholarship. That scholarship came with my tuition covered for all four years I was at Hampton. A summer internship every summer while I was in college and a full-time job when I graduated, not from high school, but from college, all the day I walked across the high school stage, they actually selected me for that scholarship. I went on to go to Hampton University and graduate with my electrical engineering degree. When that happened, I told myself that because I had some phenomenal assistance and help, that I would make it my life's mission to help other students to be able to do the same. So that's my why. I have two sons currently going through the same process in college right now. So I can relate to you as a parent on this talk. Um, having gone through the process recently, I can relate to you as a graduate student. I have an electrical engineering bachelor's degree, two master's degrees, one in computer information systems, an MBA, and I have a doctorate in business administration. So I can relate to most all of y'all on here in some capacity. But one of the things I did was I put the things that I learned by doing it myself and helping thousands of other students. I put those in a book and I published two books. One is called College Planning Strategies, I wish someone had told me. And the other one is College Funding Strategies, I wish someone had told me. And I wrote the second book because I had so many families say, Dr. Christie, we got into college, but now we're trying to figure out how to pay for it. That's a real reality. And it was just as important for me to talk about that. 
I've also been a scholarship winner, a scholarship judge, and I have worked in many different ways and I actually provide my own scholarships and give scholarships away every year at my Youth College and Career Excellence Summit, which I'll talk about at the end of my presentation. But um, the key thing I want you to take away from my why is to much is given, much is expected. And so I am happy, happy, happy to be in this space to be able to share some golden nuggets with you on this process. So the first part, we're gonna talk about the whole college um, planning and college admissions piece. And then in the second part, we'll talk about the funding. Now my book, I usually have 10 strategies in both books, they have 10 strategies. And they give you the basic things that if you're gonna be successful in getting into college, staying in college or graduate school and being able to graduate and not have to pay as much out of pocket, not have to take out much in student loans or if anything in student loans and potentially graduate debt free, then these strategies will absolutely help you. And I'm here to share and break those down for you. Now, when I wrote my books, I also created workbook templates. Um, my sons were my inspiration for this because my um, oldest son said to me when I was writing my first book, Mama, you can't just tell people what to do. You have to show our generation how to go about getting it done. And the light bulb came on, which is the reason why you see a light bulb with all my branded materials, because it's like, aha, that makes sense. That I, that I not only tell you, hey, you need to do this, this, and this, but I'm showing you how. So throughout my talk today, if you see me refer to one of my templates, um, it is because my templates are available in a hard copy and also a digital format for you to not just reference, but my templates are fillable and you can use them so that you don't spend your time creating the templates. You're sp spending your time using them to maximize what you do next. So you'll hear me introduce some of these in the talk. Um, and they're also available on my website, both digital in a digital format and in a hard copy. So take a journey with me. We're gonna go on a little journey um, and we're gonna hit five key stops along this journey. We're gonna talk about how do you develop a plan and use your time wisely. We're gonna talk about creating a scholar profile, which is like a one page resume for educational purposes. And then we're gonna talk about why is it so important to choose your major and pick your colleges. So we can't, that's the career planning part of it. You really can't talk about college without thinking about your careers as well. And you have to have some idea, in my opinion, of what you might be interested in, what you might be good at, or what you might wanna see yourself doing. And so we'll talk through that, and then we'll talk about how to apply to colleges what are those key steps and key parts of the application? And then lastly, in the second part of the talk, we'll talk more about the funding process. I always kick it off with my conversations. In order for you to go on a road trip, you have to know where you're starting from. I'm right now located in Stafford, Virginia. If I were to go to Maryland, then I would need to put in where am I now so that it can properly calculate how long it'll take me to get to where I'm going. This assessment works the same way. Students and parents, I encourage you both to answer basic questions to understand in what place am I entering this space? So as you're putting together your plan, you need to realize certain things. And if you don't have those things, um, if you can't think those things through and know that you have them reasonably um, accounted for, then you wanna think through that to make sure you do. Here are a couple of key questions that I want you to ask yourself as we're talking to make sure if you don't know the answer to this, when you leave my workshop, you have some homework to do. One, do you know your current GPA or your child's GPA? Whether you're in school or your child's in high school or you're in graduate school, it's important to know your GPA after every semester. I drove my sons crazy because every semester, I wanna know what's your grade point average for the semester and cumulative because you don't know how many opportunities are gonna come your way. But if you don't know what your grade point average is, you can't take advantage of them. Secondly, true or false, only students with a high GPA get scholarships. 
The answer is oh. false. Good. Thank y'all. I love interactive uh, workshops. Thank you. That is absolutely false. We'll talk more about that. But there's all different types of scholarships out there. So don't be discouraged if you don't have a 4.0. When I was in high school and that scholarship I talked about, I had a 3.6 good GPA, but I wasn't the valedictorian. But what I did do was get the most scholarship money that year out of any female in my high school. So don't let that deter you from looking for all different types. The third one, what's your school counselor's name? If you don't know, or if you're in college, your academic counselor's name, advisor's name, know those things because you never know when they can help you in different ways. What, ha what do you think would have happened in my situation if my school counselor didn't know I wanted to even be an engineer. She would not have been able to pull me out of class that day and tell me about that scholarship. So build and develop those relationships. Make sure they know who you are. I don't care if they don't know the other kids in your class, in your whole graduating senior class or sophomore class. Make sure they know you. Four, make sure you understand the process to get your transcripts. We already talked about that. But if you don't know how to get your transcripts from every high school you went to, because you will need them from all the high schools if you went to more than one, and same with the colleges. So my um, student who's working on an associate's degree, as you get your associate's degree and you move on to a bachelor's degree, now mm -hmm. every time somebody asks you for transcripts, you need to pull them from every place because all your courses need to tell the complete story. So anytime they ask you for your undergraduate um, transcripts, you better be pulling them from your community college or from your associates back uh, university and also from your undergraduate bachelor's university. Okay. No, Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, five, true or false. The best time to apply to college is in the spring of your senior year or the spring of any year. Let's say you want to go to grad school. Do you should, should you apply in the spring or the fall? Any anyone who want to guess? I'm oh. curious, but I would think it would be the spring. And I'm, yeah. <laughs> particularly for high school seniors. Now, grad okay. school could be a little different because they start on different schedules and different cycles. Okay. But this question was initially designed for high school seniors gotcha. or high school students. You want to, if you if you know high schoolers, the fall, here's why. Most colleges give out their financial aid that the university can award on a first come first serve basis. So if you wait until the spring of that academic year, that been. money is likely already accounted for. So anytime you are, even if you are if you know you wanna to go to graduate school, you still wanna apply early in the fall and get locked in, even if you're not gonna to start till the spring, because if they have access to certain funding, is usually going to be given out at the beginning of the calendar academic year as opposed to the end. So keep that in mind. Also, what are your top three college career choices? If you don't know what they are, start thinking about it. Same with your top three college choices. Start thinking about it. Um, number eight, true or false, most colleges and universities, this is for high school students, prefer the SAT over the ACT test. That answer is false. Colleges generally accept them both. In fact, um, pre-COVID, I would tell all the teens that I work with, take both those tests. Take both tests, see which one you test naturally the best at, then you prep for it, and then you retake that test. Number nine, true or false, average grades in hard classes are better than A's in easy classes. True or false, what do y'all think? The answer is true. Colleges like to see that you're willing to challenge yourself. So they would much prefer you to get a B in a hard class than an A in an easy class because they're going to look at it. I was in high school. I think I took um, physics, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus. So when they look at my transcript versus somebody who just took discrete math, <laughs> they're going to say, wow, Christy really challenged herself and did reasonably well. I might not have gotten an A, but I tried to get at least a B, but they do love seeing you challenging yourself from a rigor standpoint, academic rigor standpoint. And then lastly, true or false, social media accounts and your online reputation does not matter. False. Thank you, Ms. Bonita. Mm -hmm. False. And this is for undergraduates and graduate students and high school students. 
A lot of these college admissions folks now, people even giving out scholarships, they're Googling you, they're link, looking your LinkedIn profile up, checking out your social media because they want to know who they're giving their money to or who they're admitting into their university. Get a sense of um, who you are. Not so much when I was in high school because we didn't even have the internet, but now they have so much information. They are turning down people for scholarships if they're finding out certain things like your races or your, you know, spinning negative things, spinning negative things about people or being toxic or bullying people. They're like, no, they don't necessarily mesh with our culture. So you definitely want to make sure. And I always tell people, and remember, remember this in life, how you show up on paper, which is usually the first pe first way people are going to get introduced to you on paper, in person and online. All three ways matter in today's society. So usually they're going to see your application or they're going to see your essay and they're going to learn about you that way. That's the on paper way or your test scores. Then they're going to Google you online. We talked about that. But then they also might ask you like they did for my scholarship for an interview. They wanted to meet me in person. So you have to make sure you manage yourself as a brand and how you show up will matter. So that is why I say when you start this process, think about I'm in grad school right now or I'm a high school senior. Um, I have some funding. I'm really here because I want to learn how to get more or I'm thinking about transitioning from an associate's degree to a bachelor's degree. So now I may be looking at finding schools again and let me learn more about these things so that I can choose ju judiciously, judiciously about what it is you want to do next. So the second step on this journey is to think about, um, did I miss? Okay. The next thing I want you to do is think about how do you choose a career or a major for yourself? So as you put together your plan, you everybody should have a plan. You should be thinking about what you want to do after you graduate, high school, college, graduate degree. What do you want to do with that? But here's the thing I always encourage, particularly high schoolers, always choose a career and majors, then choose colleges. Does anybody tell me why you would want to figure out what you want to study before you pick a college? Um, some colleges may not offer certain um, majors. That's exactly right, Miss Bonita. If you pick a college, you done paid your money, you done signed up, your enrollment fee, you got your housing, you in the dorm, and you didn't even bother, and now you're going to register for your classes and you realize they don't even have my engineering. They don't even have engineering at all at this school. Why am I here? That, you don't want to waste your time and effort that way. And the other benefit is it gives you the ability to look for funding associated with your career or major. So two key reasons, you want to make sure they have your program, academic program you're interested in. And also, if there are entities at all within the university or private entities who are giving out money, you want to know that because you have chosen a major and you can start targeting money specifically around those areas. Now, here's a fact. Don't feel like just because you choose a major, let's say I had, I had chosen electrical engineering, for example, which I did. And then later on, I decided, uh, I'm not really feeling that. I want to move over and do political science. You can change your mind. So don't feel like you're stuck or don't feel pressured that you have to be so locked in for the rest of your life. Most professional adults have changed careers at some point. I started out in electrical engineering, practicing in engineer. You would be surprised how my career has positively evolved since then. I now am an entrepreneur. I also work for a nonprofit. I also do a lot of work in the youth development space around technical issues like STEM, still related to my engineering, global climate change, but it's not a direct engineering role I'm in. So you can use what you know and to help you to grow. I like that. Use what you know to help you to grow. And as you grow, you evolve professionally as well. And you have to give yourself room to do that. Also, fact two, whatever you choose, it will involve learning. Now, I say this for my high schoolers who say, uh, Dr. Christie, I don't want to go to college because I'm tired of school and I'm tired of learning. And I look at him, I said, my dear naive child, I said, whether you choose to go into the military 
straight into the workforce, go to a trade school or a college or a university. You will inevitably have to be trained and you will still, that will still involve learning. You cannot escape the reality that nobody's going to hire you and not train you or expect that you're willing to learn. So I try to share that with them so that they live in reality for the most part. Third fact, you can change what you choose. I've kind of already talked about that. Once you learn more about yourself and what you're interested in, don't be afraid to make some modifications and realign yourself at the right time. Now, here's the other thing I would encourage. Do your research, whether you're in high school, college, grad school, doctorate student. We know doctorate students know about research. But here's the key thing. Know, learn, go out and Google and learn. What are the different colleges and majors? What are the careers that are in high demand right now? If you get a career that's in high demand, you always eat. Doctors, nurses, engineers, technical, STEM fields, you name it. And there's a lot of other complementary fields but know what's in demand and try to find something that gives you the best earning potential and best career opportunities for you to be able to move around and progress within your career. Research different colleges, schools, and training programs. Not everybody wants to go to a four-year college or university. So if you want, I've met students who say, I really enjoy cosmetology and I wanna own my own business. Well, guess what? You don't have to go to a four-year school to be great at cosmetology. So find out what vocational and trade schools or training programs there are to help you to get certified. Know what possible jobs are out there for your major. I don't know how many times I've seen students choose majors, go through four years of education, paying for it, sometimes with student loans, only to graduate and cannot find a job. Any particular reason why you don't know you can't find a job when you have access to smartphones and other devices and you just haven't done your research? So I would encourage you to do your research to make sure that you know what your earning potential is before you lock in. Also, once you've chosen a career or major, find out what the education and training requirements are. What do you have to have to be good in that profession? Then you go and look for those colleges. Know how much the tuition or the training costs. Vocational colleges or schools, trade schools, there may be costs associated with them as well. And it's important to know what that is as you're making decisions. And lastly, what salary are you interested in? So if you're choosing a career and it doesn't make very much money, know that going in and be okay with that decision. But if you know that you want to make or increase your earning potential, you might wanna explore other careers that will allow you to do that or think about being an entrepreneur or be creative about how to make up that funding shortfall that you want from an earning potential. But you should not graduate not know that you can't get a job in that career field and not know that, oh my God, I'm not going to make any money. You shouldn't spend four years in anybody's college or university and not have done your research because those are very important life factors. Now, I do want to expose you to the notion that if you don't know what you want to do, it's okay. But part of your research is do some self-exploration and find out what tools are available to help you learn more about different career options so they can they're great tools online tools that tools out there that are free that can help you to learn more about your skills interests what you value and then they'll greatly match you with other careers different professions and jobs that you might be a really good fit for so we're going to highlight one and i just want to walk you through this is called a onet profiler and if you go to mynextmove.org or scan the QR code, and I'll make sure that um, Ms. Waller gets these slides to share with all of you as well. Um, so don't feel like you have to write everything down because these slides will be available. But it's a tool that's administered by the Department of Labor, and it's a great tool to help you to learn more about yourself and explore your interests so that you can find out what you wanna do next. There's about 60 questions and don't be alarmed because you can get through them pretty quickly the way they designed this tool. All you do is they have these smiley and frowny faces and you just read this uh, over here in this section, the interest, do you have an interest in these items, read these items and you just put the frowny face if it's something you definitely with the tongue out if you're definitely not interested or a big smiley face showing all your teeth if you're really interested. And you can quickly click, 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 go through all of these um, 
different interest and um, it'll spit out. Let's see. So once you go through all 60 questions, it will give you it will give you your results and it will give you whether you want a career that's more realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, like being an entrepreneur or a conventional type of a role. And it'll tell you where you fare on all of these. I actually took this assessment, y'all. And these were my results. My, As you can see, there's no big divide in any of these categories with my results. Now, I might say that I'm well balanced. I also might say that I'm all over the place, but it depends on how you choose to look at it. But what it says is job zone number three. So no matter what you put into this in terms of your interest, it'll tell you how much preparation you're likely to need for the type of jobs that you're likely to be interested in or might be a good fit for you. So it says medium preparation needed. So that means medium prep job preparation. That means I probably will have to go to some school. So once I do that and I click that medium preparation, it will spit out as well what kind of careers that might be a good fit for my personality. Now, let me tell you what's really interesting about this. Child, family, social worker. What did I tell you? I'm now working with you. Um, health education specialist. I do a lot of really, it's not related necessarily to health, but I do a lot with education now. Um, legislator, broadcast announcer. I do a lot of speaking. I do a lot of social media posting, workshops, uh, speaking. Not necessarily as a primary job, but just skills that I organically use a lot. Career technical education teacher. I'm a technical profession, engineering. I educate others as an engineer. And it's wildly interested that I'm also affiliated the work I do with secondary education. So I couldn't have I couldn't have done this better myself if I had tried to do this on purpose. But as you can see, it's not too far off from the things that naturally I'm passionate about. And so while it's not one profession that I can relate to, it's actually meant several of these. And I've kind of bridged those into like this hybrid position that I'm in now or roles that I play. But that's the value of getting a sense of what are those things organically that you're passionate about and that you're interested in. So here's the other thing it did. So I just picked one for the sake of our demonstration. So I just highlighted the career technical education one. If you click on that link, it'll take you to a screen that looks like this. And it'll break down what kind of knowledge and skills do you need to have? Um, problem solving, education and training. What kind of personality you need to have? So if you know your personality is not conducive to certain things, don't, don't set yourself up for failure. Go back and look at another career that you feel like you might be more comfortable with. Um, you might use different technology. So it'll even highlight what kind of technology you might use in that profession. What kind of education? Look at this, a bachelor's degree. I have a bachelor's degree. So that's good to know that it aligns well. What kind of job outlook? It'll even tell you what the median salary range is based on that career you chose. And then it'll give you the ability to explore more information. So this is a one-stop shop to learn a lot of those things about um, th that I encourage you to do research on as a part of this effort. Now, what do you do next? So once you have those results, reflect on them, see if they closely align with things that you organically feel good about doing or you've thought about doing. Ask others who know you and say, hey, what do you think about careers and what do you think I'm a good fit for to see if people that know you well have some similarities with what the tool shared. Make a list of potential careers that you're interested in from this exercise and then figure out what kind of training and education you need. Put together a solid career plan so that now you can know how to execute to get to where you want to be next. So first of all, you're choosing a career and you're thinking about what things you're interested in. And as you're thinking about choosing a career, you're researching those colleges. And my recommendation, particularly if you're interested in an undergraduate or if you're thinking about going to grad school, is that you at least have five maybe five to 10 colleges on your short, short list of schools that you're interested in. And then use that to help find out what are the schools that, that are gonna be a good fit for you and your personality. Make sure that it's affordable. If you have the ability to visit 
the campus is online or in person, great. If not, there are a lot of virtual tour, tours and online um, campus uh, opportunities to learn more about the campus than they had 30 years ago. So take advantage of those. And then start to rank or prioritize. What are those factors that really matter to you? Do you wanna go, is it your career or the degree program you're interested in? The location of the school. Maybe you wanna to go to a larger school or a, camp, a school with a smaller campus, but know what those factors are for you and use online tools to help you navigate that. Now, this is one of the templates in my workbook. It's called a college requirement spreadsheet. So as you do the research, and I did this with my sons, they hated it at first and they loved it. Um, but you start to put list out all those colleges on the left and then put where's the school located? How much is the tuition? Do they have an online application? What's the fee to apply? All those details, you have to take testing, you have to take the SAT, what's their GPA requirement? Do they require an essay, et cetera, et cetera. Put all that in one spreadsheet. I did this with my sons and they hated it because I made them do it. But when it was time for them to actually sit down and apply to colleges, they loved it because they could quickly go down this list, see which ones had deadlines coming up first. They could also rule out schools because they thought the tuition was too high. So whatever those factors are, you're able to see it in one place. So this is one of my templates. It's referenced in my books um, in the page number. Usually if I reference something in my books, I'll put it in my presentation and tell you where to find it. So that's the case with most of um, my templates. Now, now that you have chosen a career, then you start to choose a college. We talked about that already. Do you know that there are over 2000 colleges in the United States? So don't feel like, oh my God, if I don't go to this one school that's super, super expensive, I'm just going to die. No, you're not. You, I would encourage you to pick a, an affordable school because there's so many great quality schools. You don't have to limit yourself to just one. There are different types of schools. Now, this is important because this is how you choose a school strategically and find a school that fits into your price range. Vocational trade schools, we talked about that already. If you want to pursue a license or certification for many different things or develop a skill or a trade, usually you can complete those in one to two years and you'll walk away with a certificate or certification or license. And there are many, many great and well-paid professionals who have vocational educational backgrounds. Let your, it's summertime, it's about to turn summertime now, let your AC go out. Who are you going to call? You don't, you're not calling Christy, the electrical engineer. You're going to call somebody who could likely be your best friend who's going to come out and quickly help you to get your air conditioner repaired. Very valuable skill sets to have. Very high demand skill sets, which we talked about. Then the next category are your two year colleges, a community or a junior college. Um, and as one of our um, guests on tonight said, they're working to obtain an associate's degree. Takes you roughly about one to two years to get your associate's degree and you can get your associate's degree and then migrate on to a four-year college and close out the other two years to that degree and get your bachelor's degree many um university or uh community colleges have programs with four-year colleges and they will um either offer for some four-year colleges offer associate's degrees or if you went to a junior or community college they have partnerships with the local universities in their area that will accept your credits and make it a smooth transition into a four year degree uh, university. So check that out, do your research, ask the questions. Can I transition easily to a bachelor's program either here at this current university or take my associate's degree and easily transfer somewhere else and continue to pursue my bachelor's degree? Some great opportunities there. Okay. Does that help you, Miss Bonita? It does a lot, yes. Okay, great. And so once you have decided, I'm gonna go for a you know, trade school, community college, a four year college or university. Now I want you, particularly with the two to four year colleges and universities, ask yourself, do you wanna go to a public college or university or a private one and know the difference? Public colleges are usually funded by federal or state governments. They're usually larger um, than private schools. 
they usually have two tuition um, categories. One is an in-state tuition category where the students who live in that state, if you live in Maryland and you go to a Maryland public school, you're gonna have a much more affordable tuition rate because you've been paying taxes there than someone coming from California to that same Maryland school. They're gonna pay more. I was like, you didn't pay into Maryland you know, school systems the last X years of your life. So you're gonna pay the out of state tuition rate. They go to that same school. And some students don't think it's very fair, but that's the world we live in. Now, the difference between a public school and a private school, private schools generally, they get some funding from the federal government and from state governments, but they're usually not predominantly funded that way. They usually have to raise money. They're usually nonprofit. They usually have a lot of donors and alumni giving back as well. But here's the thing. They don't have an in-state and out-of-state tuition. They don't care where you come from. They want your private school money. So they have one tuition rate and everybody's gonna pay that rate. And they're usually, private schools are usually more costly than public schools, which in my example, that's why I told my story at the beginning. When I said, I wanna go to Hampton, my mama said, mm -mm, you better find you a public school because she knew it was private and it would cost more. And I already had two sisters in college. So those things matter in your decision-making. Now, that's one part of the choosing a college, vocational, community, college, four-year school, public or private. Now, do you know the difference between a PWI and a HBCU? Predominantly white institution, that's a PWI. So if you ever hear anybody say, oh, I went to a PWI, oh, I went to a HBCU, there are distinct differences. PWIs are usually, um, they're both institutions of higher learning, obviously. Uh, but, um, and they, PWIs, they particularly have, they have community colleges, but they also have four-year colleges and universities. And most PWIs are predominantly made up of Caucasian or white students, at least probably 50% or more of its enrollment. That's why they get the predominantly white institution label. They can be public or private. And usually they um, enroll more than 9 million students each year. Now on the flip, as a proud graduate of a HBCU, shout out to the Hampton University, um, HBCUs have existed for more than 200 years, y'all. Here's why. Because at, at back in the day, back in the 1800s, we weren't able, late 1800s, we were not able to pursue an education at PWIs. So guess what? HBCUs were created and established to educate African Americans. Today, there are more than 107 HBCUs in the United States. They can also be public or private schools. So you still need to know the difference. I went to a private HBCU, but there are also public HBCUs. And each year, HBCUs enroll more than 230,000 students. So as you can see, these are great options. I will tell you, I stand 100% on my HBCU education wouldn't trade it for the world, love the family oriented environment, the nurturing that I received from the teachers, the smaller class sizes. And even to this day, since I've graduated, it's still the people that I've met and went to school with, we're still closely uh, uh, connected and we're, it's like a family that you have for life. So there are pros and cons to PWIs, HBCUs. There's also historic serving institutions as well and others. So know those differences and figure out where you best fit. And it's not the same for everybody. So now that you have a career, some careers narrowed down, you have some colleges narrowed down, put together your plan. Everybody should have a clear and effective plan. Your plan should include things like, I need to have a scholar profile. I need to research colleges. I need to take tests, the SAT or ACT test. I need to look for scholarships. I need to, a plot of these colleges by certain dates. I need to X, Y, Z. Your plan should not be complicated. If it's complicated, you're not doing it right and you're gonna stress yourself out and that's not the intent. In my uh, workbook, I do have a template for a basic college uh, plan um, and you can include both your college admissions and your funding items on the same plan. And I would highly encourage that so you can see everything in one place. But you should have the goals. What are the tasks and goals you want to get accomplished? 
What type of task a goal is it? How much is it going to cost you? Now, this was not important to my young men in my house, my sons, but it was very important to me as their mother. My youngest son, about three years ago when he was um, applying for colleges, he applied to 13 colleges, y'all. Anybody want to take a guess, come off mute or put in the chat how much total I paid in college application fees alone? Benita, you want to hedge a guess? Yes. Um... Oh, you said $1,200. Thank you. T said zero. Not too far off. $980 just in application fees. I ain't paid a lick of tuition, <laughs> no enrollment fee, but $980 over 13 schools for application fees. Now, the good news is, that's the bad news. It was 980 The good news is he had a college plan and they were on his plan well before his senior year. So mama had the benefit of being able to stack my dollars and my coins. And mm -hmm. I already knew to anticipate that before his senior year. So having a plan and having the funding on it helps you to be able to be strategic with your actions and your financial resources. Also, you want to include the start due date for all of your um, activities. And then this percent complete is probably my favorite column because I love getting things done, y'all. So when I see things go to complete in 100%, woo I feel like I've accomplished something, at least for the day. So track your progress because that way you'll know, oh my gosh, I haven't started you know, scheduling my SATs. It's at 0%. I need to get on it with those things. Um, the college plans, I, almost everything I do in life, I start with a plan. Highly recommend that you do so. Don't overcomplicate it. A simple spreadsheet or other tool that works for you based on your style, but have some plan in place. So that's my key takeaway. Have a plan, account for the funding on it. I also wanna encourage you to use your time wisely. Um, you'll find in my template of workbooks, I recommend what each grade should be doing. Eighth through 10th graders, there are certain things that they should be doing every year. I'm not gonna get into the specifics, same with 11th grade. 11th grade, you're starting to take this process a lot more serious because you are soon approaching your senior year. And if you're smart and diligent and you position yourself well before your senior year, your senior year with all of these efforts will be very smooth. And then certainly your senior year, there's a lot more sense of urgency. But my key takeaway, whether you're in high school or whether you are working on a, you're currently a college student or working on, you know, a, a higher degree, you want to build a plan and you need to think about what are those steps you need to take to get you set up. There are things that if you're going to apply to a new college or transfer somewhere differently, you need to know what their deadlines are. You need to know what you need to be backing up and doing, getting your transcripts and all those things in place long before the deadlines hit. So that's the key takeaway. I want you to make sure you have a plan. Any questions so far while I grab a sip of water? No. Okay. Well, we talked about protecting your brand. So I'm just, I'm not gonna belabor that too much, but here's what I want you to take away. How you show up does matter. We've already talked about three of the ways. I think I added to it in person, on paper, online, but also in school and on the court if you're an athlete. Now, let me tell you why the in school matters. Let's say Miss Bonita is like, okay, I'm about to hit this four-year college, finish my bachelor's degree. Oh, wait, I need a letter of recommendation. Dr. Christie, hey, I was in your computer course. Remember, I could you write a letter of recommendation for me? And I'm like, well, Miss Bonita showed up late every class assignments were crappy and poor quality she had an attitude problem whenever i called on her for something no i i can write you a letter but i don't know if you really want me to because i'm going to be honest in it so how you show up in school academically matters because that could be the difference between somebody writing you a really powerful letter or you're not really finding a whole lot of people willing to write you a positive letter at all so i do share that with students i added that onto my talk because 
I don't think they often realize that their attitude dictates their altitude and they need to start thinking about those things differently early on. What you do now will help to not just academically, but also professionally help you to separate and differentiate yourself from the competition. So always keep a positive attitude, use self-discipline, be the example and the leader in most situations. Be respectful, even when people get on your last nerve, especially when people get on your last nerve, and always strengthen your ability to communicate well. So as you think about branding yourself, I want you to think about building a scholar profile. Now you say, Dr. Christie, what is this scholar profile you've mentioned? It's simply a one page educational resume. Some people call it a brag sheet, self-reflection, self-assessment document. But this is the way you tell the story of who you are on paper. This is how you help others to get to know you before you walk into the room. And if you say, well, Dr. Chrissy, what's on this scholar profile? There are about 10 different categories. I've created it. I have a template for you. You don't have to start from scratch, of course. But it has, you could include a, a professional picture. Sometimes a scholarship provider or a college will say, please attach a picture and show us, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's optional. If you think you're going to be discriminated against if you share a picture, don't do it. So um, in most places, I would say don't do it unless you're asked to do it. Um, it'll have your name, address, contact information, that sort of thing. Um, you might want to share what your professional objective is. It, mine would have been to attend Hampton University and to graduate with an electrical engineering degree. Bam, bachelor's degree. Bam, a one sentence statement. It could share your educational history. Um, if you are currently, if you're like Miss Bonita, you're going to a, um, you're working on an um, associate's degree, you would list your current college. Um, your G current GPA, um, maybe her objective would say to um, complete my associate's degree and to transfer into a four year um, university to major in or to graduate with an X degree. So now I know, oh, I know Mr. Bonita is here and she's trying to get there. And now I'm going to be looking at her education. I'm going to be looking at her current GPA. And then I want to know what she's what else has she done? Does she have any honors? Does she have honors working on her associate's degree? What other accomplishments does she have? Is she working? Working professional, working student? Does she have other extracurricular activities? Maybe she has community service. What are the relevant courses? So for me, I was an engineer. So relevant courses for an engineer might be computer classes, IT classes, math and science classes. But whatever your particular objective or goal is, have classes that you highlight highlight on your scholar profile that models or aligns with that. And then interest in hobbies. People always question, Miss Chrissy, why would I put my hobbies on there? Who cares if I like to play the guitar? When it's time for you to apply for scholarships, stay tuned. You might benefit from having that in one place and being able to quickly draw from that. So here's how you can use that scholar profile. You can use it for college applications, I had my niece do this for the first time when I first started this process and she attached the scholar profile to her college applications and differentiated herself from every other student who was applying. Secondly, you can use it for scholarship applications. My niece also got scholarship applications and she attached this um, letters of recommendation. Let's say you had a recommender like Miss Bonita. She was reaching out to me for a letter of recommendation. And she says, well, I know I was in your computer class, but also here's my scholar profile to tell you more about me as you write my letter. That's gonna be very helpful. Essay writing. Imagine when you sit down to write an essay, you can't remember what you did, when you did it, how many awards you got, when you got them, and what other activities or things that might tie in nicely with your essay writing. Use it for that as well. And then it's a great transitional document as you're moving out into the workforce. So you can use it to be the basis for your first or your resume as you seek employment opportunities. So this one one pager is so incredibly powerful. Here's how it looks when it's completed. This is exactly one what you'll see when you download the template. And you just fill in, you change all the different categories and put your personal information here. Add a picture if you want or not. You can download it. There is a free template for this on my, if you use this QR code, you can get to it pretty quickly. 
but utilize it. Every student who follows Christie's system, my system with my books, has a scholar profile. If somebody says, and I had this happen recently, um, a friend of mine said, hey, we have a job and we're looking for recent college graduates. Have them send their resume. Well, guess what? They had a scholar profile they could send easily. Five minutes later, it was in that inbox of that person who asked me. So make sure you create these tools now so that they can help you instantly when you need them. Your scholar profile is a great way to also assess your strengths and weaknesses. Let's say you complete this for the first time and you say, well, ooh, I don't have no community service. I've not done no community service. That's a whole problem. So now you can close the gaps, get involved, close the gaps and fill them as you see them on your scholar profile. Also, I did this with my sons. Update your scholar profile every summer break. So all of you rolling off of um, spring semester in high school or college, when you get home and take a deep breath, spend five minutes and update your scholar profile on what you just did that last semester. And then when my sons would come home on Christmas break after the fall semester, they would spend five minutes doing it again. And only include this scholar profile with applications such as college and scholarship applications if the entity says you can attach additional documents. If they say things like, oh, don't give us any additional documents that we didn't ask you for, never, ever, 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 ever attach the scholar profile because that would be the first way to get disqualified because you can't follow directions. And Christy encourages every student to follow directions. So please read the directions carefully and follow them. And then the last part of this segment is to make sure you understand the college application process. What are the parts of the college application? So you've done all this great research on your careers. You already know which colleges you're targeting. You know the difference between all those colleges. You know the requirements it'll take to get admitted. And you are, and you have a plan. Now that you have a plan and you've built your scholar profile, now everything starts to come together. With your college application, there are key parts. It's the application itself, your official transcripts, essays, if that college or university requires them, and letters of recommendation, again, if they are required. And then your test scores, if they are required. Some colleges don't require all these things anymore. It is your responsibility to know what every college requires because every school is different. The first thing I would encourage you to do once you look at a college's requirements is make a checklist when you get ready to apply and say, this is what's required. This is what must be in the package and it has to be in there this way and by this date. Follow directions. Every college's instructions are different. Some colleges want you to mail in an application or you can fill it out online at the college website or you can use portals like the Common App and the Common Black College App, which we'll talk about, and know that their application fees are not all the same. I paid that $980 for my son. Some colleges had a $0 college application fee. Some others were as high as about $100. So you should know what those fees and costs are. Now, know the difference between an early decision and an early action. Early decision means one school that if you got accepted, this is your top school and I really, really, really want to go there. So I'm very likely to go there if they tell me yes. Now, with early decision, you can only choose one school to apply early decision because you're entering into a binding agreement that if they accept you, you're going to go there. So you're sending the strongest message to that college or university that this is my top choice school. Usually those um, applications are due around early to mid November. And then the second class of um, decision or action is the early action. You can apply to as many colleges as you want early action. You're just applying early, but you don't have to commit to go to any of those schools um, as your top choice just because you applied early action. Early decision means, oh, I'm making a decision. Early action means I'm just gonna get them all in early. So generally you want to get those in around November. See, that's in the fall. Remember that I asked that question? It's in the fall. Ain't nobody talking about no spring with no early decision and early action. So don't get that in your mind. But the good news about applying early 
as you get an earlier decision. You'll know which schools you got accepted into. You'll get your financial aid packages in and you'll find out how much money they're offering you earlier. And you can decide who's offering you the most money and they're giving out that money on a first come first serve basis. We've already established that. So the earlier you apply, the earlier you can decide what to do next based on the decisions that come back. Normally, and the, it just passed, the national response deadline to choose a school is May 1st. So many colleges want you to pick by May 1st and select which college. Now, I briefly mentioned the Common App or the Common Application. Who's heard of that before? Anybody's ever heard of that before? Well, if not, let me introduce it. It is a web portal where over a thousand colleges and institutions have their college information and you can apply to all those colleges that are members in one place. You create an account, it's free to create that account and set up your profile and you can do all your college requirements research in that same portal and you can apply to all the schools that are members through that one system. Every year in August, they open up their new application for that academic year. And the real benefit is that you can reuse your personal information over and over again by applying to multiple colleges in that system. I did that with my sons. It was very easy. I didn't have to keep typing my name, my address in. You put it in there one time and it'll import it into their applications. Um, the application fees do vary. Some applications are um, free. Some colleges don't charge a fee, others do. Um, and roughly 45% of the schools that are in the Common App don't charge an application fee. So there's a lot of great benefits to using the Common App. Here's how it looks. If you go to commonapp.org, um, you can do research on the school without even having to create an account at first. But then when you get serious and you're ready to start applying, you should create an account, then sign in, um, and then you can start applying once you've established your baseline. Now, I want to introduce you to the Common Black College app. Um, now, I will say this. Let me go back real quick. Um, there are both PWIs and HBCUs in the Common app. But let's say you want to just focus and apply to HBCUs. Well, um, I, and I've met Mr. Mason, uh, Robert Mason, who's the founder of this system. Now he does college applications and his um, web portal contains scholarship applications too which is new and exciting. But you can apply to over 66 out of that 107 roughly HBCUs um, through his portal. You pay like a one-time $20 fee, set up your account. But you can apply to multiple schools through this system without having to pay college applications. So you might pay $20 on the front end, but the, the application fees to all the colleges, the HBCUs, you don't have to pay anything additional. Um, you can upload test scores in both those platforms, and you can reuse your applications again. So very similar to the Common App, but it's for HBCUs. Next in the process, I want to make sure you know how to get your college and your high school transcripts. Um, key, I'm not going to belabor this point because we've already talked about it, but please just know the process. Know the process to get your transcripts. Make sure that you follow up with your high school or your colleges to make sure they send it off by the deadlines that you need. It's your responsibility to, to request it early enough for them to have a chance to um, get those out, but follow up, follow up, follow up. Don't just make an assumption that, oh, I'm at the top of their list, they got it out. Sometimes schools make mistakes and they don't get your documents out in time. That's your responsibility to make sure that happens. So I, I don't do anything without a paper trail, documentation, tracking, and the follow up. Um, I'm not going to really get into this a whole lot, but if you, this is just a sample transcript, which shows where your GPA is on it. It has to be official. Pay attention to that because some entities only want official, unopened, sealed transcripts. Others will take unofficial copies of transcripts. So please pay attention to what type of transcript you are providing and what type of transcripts folks are asking you for. Because if you were me, if, if I had a scholarship and I said, I want your official transcripts and you gave me an unofficial transcript, I'm not looking at your package any further because you didn't follow directions. I'm gonna move on to the person who did. No, you're not getting a second chance. 
No, it's not my fault you didn't follow directions. So I keep emphasizing following directions for a reason, y'all, because people don't like their time wasted and they don't have a lot of time to circle back around. Next, you are applying to colleges and for scholarships. So I wanna talk about essays and letters of recommendation. Did you know you need two types? No. You do. Because if you were getting writing an essay for a college admissions, Miss Bonita, you're going to say, here's why Miss Bonita is a good candidate to be admitted into your bachelor's degree program or your college to work on a bachelor's. If you're looking, Miss Bonita has gotten into the college and now Miss Bonita is looking for money, she's going to write about, here's why Miss Bonita should be awarded your scholarship money. Same with letters of recommendation. Here's why Chrissy should be accepted into your college or university. Here's why you should give Chrissy your money. So when you are either writing your essays, have the right mindset, or you're asking for letters of recommendation, you want to ask recommenders for two types. I need it for college admissions and or I need it for scholarships. They're not the same letter. They're not addressed to the same people unless the college is giving you the scholarship. But there's a lot of private entities that will also ask for letters of recommendation. I'm going to give you a few strategies with essay writing. I usually do a whole workshop on essay writing because what I'm finding, this is the single most important step in getting scholarships these days. Test scores are now becoming somewhat optional to get admitted into colleges. Sometimes they ask for them for scholarships. Sometimes they don't. But essays, this is the best shot for you to tell your story like nobody else can. Can't nobody tell your story like you can. And it needs to show through your writing. So you want to develop and make sure you have your scholar profile as you're writing your essay. Have a plan. You mean I need a plan for essay writing, Dr. Christie? Ideally, highly recommend it. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. But you should say, okay, here's what I'm gonna, how I'm going to approach this essay. We're going to do a little bit of research. We're going to investigate a little bit more about the entity, the topic they're asking me to write about. Then I'm going to spend a few minutes getting myself organized by brainstorming, having a basic outline that's going to be the structure of my essay. Then I'm going to write my essay out, and then I'm going to get it proofread and finalized. Those are the basic steps that I encourage with every essay. As you are writing, let me give you some of my best practices. Never, ever, ever throw away your essay writing prompts anything you've written. Save it, reuse it over and over again. I did it when I was getting my scholarships and still do it now when I'm with other when I'm helping others. Secondly, find trusted individuals to proofread and critique your writing. Please, uh, my doctorate student in the group, no matter how good you are at writing, don't you find that there are always ways to improve your writing skills? Yes, ma'am. I actually, um, I get all my papers um, proofread um, by a good professional that I've been, actually I have a resource that I've been friends with now for about six, seven years was my previous manager. So I still actually still build on my relationships with people. So yeah, I still, I still get my stuff proofread even by my older professors from undergrad school. That's so, my for sharing. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. And, and and so we cannot be, and the key reason why I wanted her to speak is because by the time you get to the doctorate level, you've done a lot of writing. But that is not the time to get so arrogant to think, oh, I'm the best writer in the world. I don't need to have proofread. On the contrary, you look at your work so closely, you need somebody else that you trust. And it sounds like Ms. Powell has someone she trusts to read and proofread, proofread her writing. You and free Go ahead. Um, also, it's not even just um, having someone to trust, also on different subjects. So I stayed aligned with my field um, for the past, you know, for, with both of my degrees and now moving on to my doctorate degree, but I mixed up my degrees. So, and I just wanted to just chime into that because, you know, I know everyone's trying to figure out exactly what they wanted to do. I started out with a bachelor's in business management and I minored in healthcare administration. And with that bachelor's in business management, that gave me, I, I think I took about nine different courses in so many different type of healthcare courses for that minor. Mm -hmm. And I had to figure out which part of healthcare I wanted to go into. So once I figured that out, that's how I moved into my master's in healthcare services and administration. 
minoring in public health. So that's kind of how I aligned my field. I never wanted to leave the healthcare field, but I also wanted that business aspect mm -hmm. of my career as well. So that's what's gotten me to where I'm at today. That is great. And um, that's really good to share um, because you certainly want to make sure that you give yourself some flexibility in your career path. And that's a great example of that. And so as you create that flexibility, your writing will shift to account for those experiences. And you want to make sure that as you're writing um, in general, whether it's essays or even papers for your academic pursuits, you want to use some of these strategies. Um, I, I love using the online tools like Grammarly um, to help. I did this when I was in, working on my doctorate. I would push all my papers, import my papers in. It will mock them up, redline them, and spit it back out. Now, I recently learned through my um, sweetheart that Grammarly now has an AI function, and it'll help you write it in general. So utilize those tools to help you to really um, strengthen your writing. Follow direction. So if somebody gives you an essay and say, I only want 500 words, don't go over 500 word count. Use your tools to make sure that you stay under the 500 word count and don't go, don't give them 501 words and say it'll be okay. Give them what they ask for. Stick to the deadlines. And if they ask you to write on a particular topic, stay on topic. Don't veer off because you like talking about something else. This isn't the time. You can talk about whatever you want, but that doesn't mean you're going to get access to their funding or get accepted because they felt like your writing was uh, subpar. Um, write on different topics and save them. I am notorious for having leadership. I'll, I'll save my essays and under different categories. This is a leadership one. This is based on um community service one whatever those prompts are save all of those and always demonstrate that you know something about the entity that you're writing about have a fact or statistic or something that shows that for example um i've seen students that say i closely align with your core your or your your university's core values of integrity and honesty i'm just making that up but they love to see that you've taken the time, you've gone out and you've researched who they are and what they're about, but you're organically building it into your essay. It shouldn't be, I went to your website and wrote about, that's not how you wanna do it, but you wanna naturally build that back in. Also, I had the pleasure of having um, coffee with a young lady who had gotten received over a million dollars in scholarship. Her name is Maya Mundale, you can actually look her up. And I said, well, Maya, how did you get a million dollars in scholarship offers? And she said, I said, what made the difference? And she shared that she always wrote about in all of her writing, how she was gonna make a difference to other people in her community, in the world. So every writing you have, make sure you somehow tie it back into how you're gonna make a difference to make things better in your writing save and reuse your content for multiple um you know college and scholarship applications in what you're doing every essay in my mind in my in my recommendation should be well organized but this is where your um outline comes in you should have an introductory section of your outline a body and a conclusion your introduction should end with a powerful thesis that will introduce three key points that you're going to touch on in the rest of your essay and then your essay is going to talk about uh, at least a paragraph or some breakdown of each point separately. You're going to expand on each one of those three points and then wrap it up with the conclusion. Conclusion is a great place to tie in. Here's how I want to make a difference in my community. Or if you, here's how I'm going to make a difference or impact, you know, by getting this degree or how I blend in well with your college or university or why my financial need will help me to be able to make, you know, by giving me, granting me this scholarship. It'll give me the ability to make a difference in the world. People love giving you your, their money when they know that you're going to use it to pay it forward is the key point. Um, and then these are just some of the common essay themes that I generally see. Um, individuals who ask for essays, they usually have, um, write, have individuals write on. Now, also I mentioned a tool. Um, if you use Google Docs, um, I recommend you do it in a Chrome browser. But it's a great tool. Let's say you don't like to write, like typing in or you type slow and you got to get something done. Well, translate it to text. If you go to Google Docs and use their uh, voice typing tool, 
you can speak it in and say, I'm writing this essay on leadership leadership, and um, I want to cover three key points or however you want to, you know, just have a conversation with it. And then you can go back and it'll take all of your words, type it onto your document, and then you can go back and clean it up. Now, you never submit it just by using a translate to text model. That's just a tool to help you get started because it's not gonna format it grammatically with punctuation and all those very important details and spelling it may be off depending on how it interpreted your words. So it's a great way to get your initial thoughts out and then you be prepared to edit your, your writing. But this is a great tool if you don't like to write right. Uh, we've already talked about proofreading. Never turn in an essay that you haven't proofread. First thing you should do before you give it to anybody else is read your own writing out loud. If it sounds foolish to you out loud, it's probably going to read foolish to somebody else too. So I usually use that as a tool and I catch so many things just by reading it out loud to myself. Um, that certainly helps. Make sure you read it for clarity. Make sure you read it to make sure your sentences are complete. Your sentence structure is appropriate and it aligns and you're, you don't have any spelling errors. I usually toss out essays that have more than two spelling errors uh, when I'm judging essays because you didn't take the time to do these basics and I'd like to give funding to someone who took it more serious. So if other judges, evaluators are thinking like I think, um, please use that to your advantage. And then also um, I've talked about Grammarly, but there are other great proofreading and writing editors that can help you. People can be great editors, but Grammarly, EasyBib, Grammar Lookup, those are all other great resources and here are the links to them. And then writing, getting your letters of recommendation. Don't wait till the last minute to get letters of recommendation. Give people enough time to get those reviewed, get those written and back to you long before your deadline. Follow the instructions and share those instructions with your recommenders. Um, make sure that you reuse the content and it's okay to ask a recommender, hey, uh, Dr. Christie, I'm going to be applying for multiple scholarships. Do you mind if you make the letter general and just say dear scholarship provider, as opposed to dear Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? And they'll be happy to say dear scholarship provider. And are you okay with me reusing your recommendation over and over again if I make a copy? Christy doesn't have a problem with that, but if someone does, please respect that and not um, you know, use it unless you get their permission. Also, this is a great place to use your Scholar profile. Now, I'm gonna demonstrate how that is going to work. Now, here's this last bullet is probably the most important thing I'll share with you on letters of recommendation. And let me know if anybody's ever shared this with you before, I'd be curious. Offer to write your own letter of recommendation and have your recommender tailor it. Yes. <laughs> Anybody recommended that before? Yes. Good. I'm glad you have heard of that method. Many people don't utilize that strategy. Here's how it works. Hey, Dr. Hey, hey, soon to be Dr. Powell. Hey, Dr. Powell, I'm going to claim and I'm speaking into existence. Hey, Dr. Powell, I'm Christy from your English 10 class. I'm working on, I'm applying for scholarships and I would love it if you would write a uh, letter of recommendation uh, for me. Here's my scholar profile and I've taken the liberty of pre-drafting a letter of recommendation that I'm happy to email to you for you to tailor based on what you know about me. Now, soon to be Dr. Powell, how likely would you be to write a letter of recommendation if a student showed up that way? I will write it. I've actually done it for a student um, before I even gotten into my doctorate program with just my master's degree. I had a young lady that was starting at uh, Georgetown and she was starting in healthcare. So she asked for some pointers and uh, we communicated about everything about the program and yeah, just assisted her along the way. Mm hmm. And I'll tell you, this is great. It shows initiative initiative on your part and proactivity. And it's a little bit more work. But guess what? Dr. Christie is going to help you because in my templates, I actually include a sample format for you to use to write your own letter recommendation. You fill in all these uh, blanks here. 
It's where you can fill in adjectives and key things about yourself. But this is a great basic structure to get you started. I've done this for other students and it has taken me far less time to turn back around their letter of recommendations when they have sent me a pre-drafted copy. So utilize that um, skill to help you. Now I'm only gonna talk briefly about um, SAT and SATs. Um, you'll be able to see here that there are subtle differences in those tests and where those tests are predominantly taken. ACT is usually taken in these blue areas here around the country and the SAT in the orange geographical areas. Um, when you are picking colleges and you are thinking about which schools you wanna to go to, send them your SAT and ACT test scores. So you'll need that those colleges as you're taking and you're registering for these tests. Um, know the difference between the ACT and the SAT test. Both of them are about three hours in length. The SAT is about five minutes longer, but their scoring is different. ACT is on a score of one to 36 and SAT is on a score of uh, 400 to 1600. And also um, the ACT has um, English reading, math and one science category, but the SAT has writing, reading and two math categories with no science. So I always try to highlight that and I always try to steer students. If you really like math and science, take the ACT to help you. If you really, well, whether you like math or not, if you take the SAT, you're gonna get more math. <laughs> but if you really like science, um, definitely take um, consider taking the ACT. All right, so that is the ACT. Also, I'm including the test dates that are coming up. So if you or you know young people who need to take these tests, please um, know that their registration deadlines are coming. They're usually, you know, a few weeks before the actual test date. Um, there is a SAT date coming up on June 1st that the deadline is coming up now. And I tried to list out the rest of the dates for 2024 for both the SAT and the ACT test. There are some great prep courses available too um, that I wanna encourage you to think about as you are um, encouraging um, high schoolers to prepare. Um, they don't all have to be expensive. There are free online preps. But there are also other prep courses where if you paid a little bit more, you're going to get more guarantees and more um, opportunities to get some phenomenal strategies. But the key thing is to take the test. I always tell students, take the SAT or ACT test, get your preliminary scores back, get in a prep course, and then schedule to take the test right after you complete the test, um, the prep work. That's while it's still fresh in your mind, and that's the best time to really increase your scores. Now, as you're finalizing your um, college application, again, put together a checklist, make sure you have all those required documents included. Um, and if there are optional documents that they ask you for or that you'd like to include, um, specify those on your checklist and make sure you complete a and turn and submit a full package. Now, once you've applied to college, you're not done yet. Finish your academic year strong, whether you're in high school or you're in a graduate program or um, working on, you know, another collegiate program. Review your application, um, your acceptance letters as they come in, because they do have instructions and deadlines in them. I had a student who missed all kinds of deadlines because she never read. All she saw was congratulations, you've been accepted. She didn't read anything after that. Had missed a deadline to pay her enrollment fee and didn't do any of those steps. So please read the documents carefully once they start to come in. Um, complete the free application for federal student aid um, and make sure you review all of your college financial aid award letters and keep, keep, keep applying for scholarships. We'll talk more about this in a moment, but keep applying for scholarships as you um, are getting those acceptance letters in and making the decision about which college you'll attend. Once you've gotten accepted and once you've selected a college, you're still not done. You need to follow those instructions to make sure that you set up your student accounts, your email, paid any enrollment fees. If there's new orientation you'll need to get scheduled or pay fees for. Sometimes you'll have to pay campus housing fees if you're staying on campus. 
and deposits and they have deadlines. My son waited so long to pick a school, my oldest, that when he finally got to college, he was in the worst male dorm because all the other dorms were already taken and assigned. And he was really regretting not having done that sooner. Um, also schedule those health, um, those doctors physicals, because most colleges do require if you're, you know, most um, high school is going into college, they do require you to have school physicals, even on the collegiate level. And they fill up pretty quick over the summer. And then order, order, order your transcripts. I started adding this in, whether you're in high school, if a student's done dual enrollment, or you're in college, please get your final transcripts when you graduate. So Miss Bonita, when you graduate with your um, associate's degree, order tra sealed transcripts and have them delivered to your house and leave them unopened. Order a transcript for you to open, scan it into your computer and reuse as people ask you for electronic copies. But every time you graduate from a college and or a high school, always keep copies of your transcripts for yourself and send it out to those entities that request it. Now that brings me to the end of this talk and um, on the college planning side. And I just and I really want you to really think about what you wanna do next, whether you're in high school or you're currently out in the workforce, but you're pursuing higher education and graduate school. Um, think seriously about it, have a plan with a budget really get in the habit doing research should be a life skill that you develop around most things that you do so do your research use your time wisely and get organized uh, one of the things i had for my sons my sons and i did was we created a separate email address just for collegiate purposes and that way i had to log in to you to it they had to log in and we could monitor when deadlines or people would send things and needed a quick response we were both able to check it. Lastly, as you get help along this process, don't waste people's time. If somebody's writing a letter of recommendation for you and they say, hey, Christy, give me your scholar profile and this sample letter you talked about, give that to me by uh, Friday and you wait till Thursday of the next week, I'm like, you've wasted my time, find somebody else to write it because you, you didn't respect my time to provide it when I was able to get in that window. So don't waste their time. And most importantly, always, always say thank you. So that brings me to the end of the first talk. Are there any questions on the college and career, kind of the planning and admissions pieces? No, I don't have any. I don't have any questions, but I did want to chime in on um, keeping your transcripts. So even at where I'm at now, I still have to provide my undergrad and grad school transcripts. So please, please save it because if you don't, you're gonna have to go down that road of figuring out who was in control of the transcripts and mm -hmm. then that sent over all over again. So it's not easy. So just keep it, just keep it in a pocket somewhere. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. I'm in the same boat, having been to four colleges and you know, et cetera. Every time I do something, they want one version of some transcript. If I'm applying for a STEM job, I need to reach back to the undergraduate and pull that engineering transcript or some other type of role. And so you want to always know how to get access to them and have those for yourself to be able to quickly reference for different purposes. Definitely. All right, well, we're going to move to part two because I know I have a short window of time left and I want us to wrap up close to 9 p.m. Um, so I'm going to abbreviate some of the pieces on the college funding and really touch on a few key things that I really think I want you to walk away with tonight, but I'll make the slides available to you um, in their entirety for you to reference. So now that you have gotten through, um, or either you're gotten accepted or you're trying to figure out how to pay for school now that you've been accepted or currently in school and still looking for money, this next section is for you. My second book will focus on the funding and the strategies in it. Again, this book has templates associated with it. Now, I love, love, love. Scholarships are my absolute favorite thing to talk to people about. And I'm sorry I'm not gonna have more time to talk about it tonight, but um, we can certainly um, talk more in the future about it. But my vision for every student is to, for you to be able to get a debt-free 
quality education. These are just two test cases for me. The one on the left is my younger cousin who graduated from my alma mater in 2019 with honors from Hampton. He ended up with over $150,000 worth of value from his scholarships. He went to Hampton on a Navy ROTC scholarship, mm -hmm. didn't pay a penny out of pocket. He actually graduated um, and the day before he graduated, he was commissioned as a Naval officer. So not only did he join the military on a, and get a debt-free education, but he went in as an officer. So that's certainly one path. Another path was the, on the right, my son, uh, my youngest plays, or he played football at Norfolk State University, over $130,000 worth of scholarship val um, value. He is now um, a senior, I need to update this slide. He's going into his senior year in the fall, but he's a computer science major and he had both academic and athletic scholarships. So you don't have to limit yourself and you don't have to go broke getting a college education. So we're gonna talk about how do you make sure you know what it costs to go to school? Um, how do you put together a plan that works for you? Make sure you know how to apply for financial aid and more importantly, look for scholarships if you have a shortfall. Now, I'm gonna just kick it off by saying the same with funding. Know your funding situation. If you know you don't have the money today, if you don't want to pay it out of pocket or don't have it to pay out of pocket and you don't want to take out a lot in student loans, but you know you may have some out of pocket expenses, this workshop is for you. Make sure you start thinking about those factors that we talked about earlier that are going to affect how much money you'll have to pay. Um, I also want you to think about every college cost is different. So don't assume just because you're going to a four year school or you're looking at four year schools that they all cost the same because they don't. Every school has direct and indirect costs like tuition, room and board. Those are the costs that you pay directly to the college. And then they also have indirect costs like books, materials, supplies, computers, all those expenses. Those are indirect. You're going to have those expenses, but you don't necessarily pay them to that college or university. Um, and also, as you know, the cost of attendance, look at this little great graphic here on the right, and this is really what I want to emphasize. This same public school costs about $10,000 a year, in-state, public in-state. If you want to go to that same public in-state school and you're out of state, double the cost. If you want to go to a similar public school, triple the cost. So that's why knowing what type of college you want to go to matters because it's gonna have financial implications for you. And my last bullet, go where you can afford. Don't go in debt when you can still get a quality education and get a good degree. Also wanna make sure you know to have a plan. Um, we already talked about that, so I'm not going to get in a lot of details, but add the funding pieces to your existing plan. And know that as you create your plan, you have to account for how you're going to fund your education. You can fund it out of pocket, out of your bank account. If you have, you know, you might have it sitting in an account somewhere, which is phenomenal. And if you do, you can pay out of pocket. If you've taken, taken advantage of a college savings plan, great way to do it. Maybe you have a permanent life insurance policy. Well, it'll allow you to draw money from it and use it towards your education or retirement plan, which I don't really advocate for because retirement is for retirement. But if that's something that you feel like you want to do, it's certainly an option. And then there are outside sources like financial aid, federal, state government, um, their scholarships, grants. And then if you were currently working and you you're ask your employer, do you have educational uh, benefits or educational reimbursement benefits? Ask the question, do you know how many um, businesses or employers have it, but won't tell you about it unless you ask them that question? So start asking the question and see what kind of responses you get if you're employed and you think that that might be able to um, help you. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, ways to pay for college. And there are different ways to pay for college. Financial aid is one of the bigger ways and the federal government is a great source of financial aid. They give away or award over $120 billion a year to over the 13 million students every year for whether it's work study, which is where you can work on campus and they'll offset some of your tuition by the, the um, 
funds that you make by working on campus, grants and scholarships. Those are gift aids where money you don't have to pay back and then student loans where money you clearly do. There's over $1.7 trillion worth of student loan debt in the United States, y'all. 45 million people owe student loans. And on average, the individual owes at least 37,000 according to the education data initiative from 2023. Through the gospel, that is the truth. It is the truth. And let me tell you this, if at all possible, the work that I do is to help students not have to have that as their reality. So that's why I'm gonna passionately move quickly to talk about scholarships. But here's another breakdown. I'm not gonna go into too many details, but I had it broken down by states. Look at this, y'all. We live in the DMV area. Some of the highest places that have an average, the highest average student loan debt per borrower. DC, Maryland, Virginia in the top four. Very interesting. So that's the reason why this kind of work matters. So as we talk about two key things tonight, free application for federal student aid is one and scholarships are gonna be the other. Please, 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 whether you are an undergraduate or graduate school, excuse me, you should, every student needs to apply for the free application for federal student aid. The link of the website, fafsa.ed.gov is right here. Now, we all, if you don't know, they just revamped the application in 2023 going into 2024 this December they um they revamped it and it's a newer process I heard it's more streamlined which is great but do know this you must have this free application complete if you want a penny of federal financial aid some states require it too but it is required if you want federal financial aid and you have to specify when you're filling it out, you have to send your scores to every college or university you are thinking about going to so that those colleges can calculate how much financial aid that you can get from their college or university. Every college calculation is different. You can fill out the FAFSA for free and do know that every year you are in college, whether you're working on an undergraduate or graduate degree, you have to renew and refile for the FAFSA every year. Every year while you're thinking about going to school. So please keep that in mind. Now, I do have some details on the new FAFSA. If you've ever filled out the old FAFSA, um, it's a streamlined um, user experience. They've updated how they calculate your the funds that they could potentially award. Um, they've expanded who can be eligible for um, federal financial aid and Pell Grants. Um, let's see, what else is new? Um, there's a, as few as 18 questions. It could take some people only 10 minutes to apply. Others might have up to 26 questions to get through the process. But in the past, what it would do is it would spit you out an expected family contribution index they're no longer using the EFC term. Now they call it the SAI, the Student Aid Index. And so if you run into a school or scholarship um, entity and they say, what's your EFC? Then you really should be providing them this new SAI. This is what tells how much they think you can pay out of pocket. Not how much this university is giving you, but this index is how much they think you can pay. So that's very important because if this is high, that means you're not getting very much fat federal aid. They're going to expect you to want to pay more out of pocket. So we're going to talk about that just briefly. These are some of the documents you have to have with you, your tax forms, your ID, bank statements. If you have assets, um, you'll need to provide you know, some information about those. You will need to set up an account. And if, you're, if you have a student or a child, they'll need to set up an account if you're working with them to apply. So those, those details are gonna be very key. But I wanna walk you through. So let's say you fill out your FAFSA, you've designated the schools you want your SAI to go to. Once you fill it out, you'll get an email saying, hey, here's your SAI, here's your student aid index and your Pell Grant eligibility. You may or may not be eligible for Pell Grant. They'll also send that information to the colleges you specified. Once those colleges get it, they're going to calculate your financial aid for that university. Every school is different. 
and then they're going to send you a financial aid award letter. This is going to tell you how much they think they're, this is how much they're going to give you in financial aid and how much they think you can pay yourself. If you get that and you say, oh, wow, they're expecting me to pay out of pocket expenses. Or you may say, whoa, they're saying I don't make a lot or my income is not um, you know, sufficient enough, so I don't have to pay out of pocket. I have enough financial aid to where I don't have to pay out of pocket. Great. That's the ideal situation. But for many of us, it's not our current reality. So that means you have to make the shortfall up either out of your own pocket or look for scholarships and grants. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you about scholarships and grants. Um, I'm going to skip those, but as you apply for scholarships, which is my favorite kind of money, it's gift aid that you do not have to pay back. Grants work very much the same way. Um, grants may be a little bit more, um, the eligibility may be a little bit different to get grants, but that's another great source. But you can apply, 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 apply for scholarships. And so I want to talk to you more about it. There are five ways to get scholarships. Uh, one, you need to make sure that your scholarship, you can tailor your application. Um, you make sure you utilize your scholar profile as you're doing that to win scholarships. Have unique searches that will eliminate or reduce how many other people can compete with you against those scholarships. Track and make a list of all the scholarships you apply for and don't write trashy essays. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about essays because I've already covered it, but your essays will matter here. This is where they're gonna matter the most as you're trying to get scholarships. This, I'm no kidding. Last week, I had a young lady to text me and said, oh my God, I need your help. My son has been applying for scholarships and my husband finally took a look at our scholarships and realized that they were trash and that I needed to reach out and get somebody else to proofread it. Dr. Christie, can you proofread his essay? Sure, I will. And as soon as I took a look at it, I was like, yeah, I see why he didn't get no money. So those are the things that I'm going to share with you, strategies that are going to help differentiate you to get the funding you need. So tailor your scholarship applications. So scholarship applications have some of the same components as a college application, but you're not applying for admissions. They still may want test scores, GPA or your transcripts. They still may want your college acceptance verification. If you've gotten into a school, they want to know, are you in a school before we give you our money? They may want you to write essays or letters of recommendation, or you might be able to share your scholar profile, or they might want to know about what activities or interests you have or if you have financial need. So all these folks on the wheel could be things that you get asked to provide. Now, as you tailor your application, save all of your content, your scholar profile, your essays, make sure that you consider the college or your major that you're thinking about as you're looking for scholarships and make sure that you're professional in your scholarship application. Don't use slang. Don't use uh, shorthand like we would use on social media, OMG, LOL, that's not appropriate. Make sure you're spelling things out and being appropriate and read their instructions very, very carefully. You are very likely to get your application put to the side and never picked up again if you can't follow directions. I'm gonna leave it at that. Use your scholar profile. We've already talked about it. I'm not gonna talk about it. We already have established you can use it for this process. And then also search for unique. This is where I really wanna spend my time. Search, this is the biggest differentiators between you and everybody else who, who are applying for scholarships. Your search will matter. Between the essay you write and how you search for scholarships that you're eligible for, these are the two sections that make the biggest difference. So let's touch on this one. Look for small scholarship award amounts. There's nothing wrong with a $500 essay. They add up, or a scholarship, they add up. $1,000, $1,500. Don't turn your nose up against small scholarships. Unless you have the $500, it'll add up. Find scholarships that very few people know about. They don't even know they exist. Here's why. They don't know they exist. They're not applying for it. If they're not applying for it, 
there's not many applicants. If there's not many applicants, you're more likely to be one of the ones who get awarded the scholarship. Also, find scholarships or few people actually apply. I'm an AKA, hence the pink and green. My chapter gives a scholarship out every, we get multiple scholarships out. Guess how many people we had this last cycle to even submit applications? 15, y'all. Only 15 applicants. So apparently they don't know about our scholarship. They don't know they exist. But because not that many applied, we awarded 14 scholarships. We have 15 applicants and you mean 14 of them got scholarships? Mm -hmm. So those are, the, those are the ones you really wanna go look for. Few people are eligible for it. Look for scholarships few people are eligible for. I'm an electrical engineer. I'm a black female who's an electrical engineer. How many of those, how many people are black, can say that they're a black female and interested in being an electrical engineer? The pool just went from everybody to a really small pool of people. So find those things that are unique about you and apply for them. Um, be prepared to write the essays. A lot of people don't apply for scholarships because they don't wanna write the essays. Don't be one of them. You're gonna get, you have great essay writing strategies. You're likely to really powerhouse and write compelling essays. Few people wanna get letters of recommendation. Be one of the few that do. And lastly, no one is you. So as you write about yourself, as you uniquely look for scholarships and put together your applications, think about what makes you different. Now, I got a little quick exercise. I hope it's coming up next. Yep, here it is. So we're gonna do this together. I want y'all to read this as I read it out loud. And then I want you to think about how many scholarships do you think Gloria can apply for? Real quick. Gloria is a Japanese American high school senior with a 3.9 GPA. And she who lives in Virginia. Gloria wants to attend college and major in chemistry. She can also play the piano well. She's very smart, but has concerns that her ADHD might hinder her from learning at the same pace as others in college. Gloria is also concerned that she cannot, cannot afford college because her father died during COVID and her mother's income is low. She reached out to me because no one in her family went to college and they did not understand the college funding process. How many and what type of scholarships do you think Gloria can apply for? Come off mute, put it in the chat, whatever's your preference, but what should she be applying for y'all? Okay, let's see in the chat. Someone said 10. Thank you, Bonita. Any other guesses? Okay. Whoa, in the interest of time, I have some a cheat sheet here. I have a little cheat sheet. And it's it's this, there's still more, but just me quickly pointing them out of the same paragraph I just read, there are 13. And this was a real conversation I had with a student. My phone number in my books, I have my Google phone number in my books. And one day I was working in my office and a student called me, never met her before. Um, and she was um, a Middle Eastern, she was born in America, but her family, were, her family was from the Middle East. And she was so surprised that I actually answered my phone like I was a celebrity or something and I'm not. And she's like, oh my God, you answered. And I was like, well, yes, that's why I put my number in. And she said, she just went on talking. I need help. I don't know where to start looking for scholarships, da, 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 da. And I just listened. And everything she thought was a problem about her life, I turned it into a potential solution. And so she was a female. She was this, she was that. So all these things was built around her example. And when she finished talking, I said, you know, there's about 12 or 13 things you should be applying for that you probably have no idea. You're a female, you're a minority female. You're a high school senior who's a minority female. You have a high GPA. So now you're a high, minority high school senior female with a high GPA. You can do them individually. You can combine them together. And all of them make her unique. 
You can apply for Virginia. She said she was in Virginia. You can apply for state and local scholarships. She mentioned chemistry. You can apply for STEM or specific major scholarships. She mentioned she'd like to play the piano. So now you're getting into your arts and talents type interest. And then she talked about her ADHD. Did you know that there are scholarships for individuals with medical and learning disabilities? There are. She mentioned COVID. There were COVID impact scholarships. She mentioned her father was deceased from COVID. There are scholarships for children who are um, who have been affected by COVID or had the parent who's deceased from COVID specifically or deceased deceased in general. She mentioned her mom had low income, financial need, great scholarships for folks who have uh, you know limited income. First generation. She's the only person in her family who was considering going to college. First generation. And these are just the things that were obvious to me in a five minute conversation. So I go back to you and say, please figure out what makes you different and use that to look for different type of scholarships that can help you. Where do you go to look? Everywhere. If you go to Google and you type in any of the keywords that we've already talked about, like, um, and I would put in the year so that it weeds out like older scholarships, but Let's say you put in a thousand dollars. If you put in the Google search scholarships and put in quotations, a thousand dollars applications, scholarship applications in Virginia, it'll pop up 2024. It'll pop up with more relevant um, scholarships from this year. If you highlight or you put in quotations, chemistry, STEM, female, minority female, Japanese female, whatever those things, or you combine them, scholarship for skim. Uh, minority females interested in chemistry and the year, you will be surprised what kind of targeted scholarships come up. Once you make, once you start finding those scholarships, please make a list. And in my suite of templates is a uh, template for scholarships, searches and a tracking spreadsheet. Use that to track all of your scholarships, sort them by the deadline and every month you focus on applying for those scholarships for that month. I did that with my son and it was absolutely a great way to utilize our time and not get overwhelmed by scholarship searches. And then again, I'm gonna just remind you, don't write um, essays that aren't any good. Don't wait to the last minute. Make sure you grab the reader's attention up front. Don't restate the essay prompt. I hate it when people do that because it's a waste of energy. And make sure your essays are compelling and they tell the story about you. Now, as you do your go through the college funding process, make a checklist, have a plan, know what you um, need to do, and it shouldn't be a surprise what all needs to happen. So I know I am running out of time, but I do want to introduce you to my scholarship strategies free ebook, the QR code, some of the same strategies I've shared. They're in a great easy ebook um, that you can um, you know, scan and have as a great tool. Also, very important, I have a group, it's an exclusive group, it's called Scholarship for Scholars. And on Facebook, Instagram, and I'm on TikTok, I post a lot of videos and information on TikTok. But I highly recommend that you either subscribe, follow on all these platforms that I am on because I share scholarships, some of those unique scholarships that most people don't apply for and haven't heard about to my exclusive group members. And I have about 800 right now, close to 800. But I would highly encourage you to do that, to be among those who get access to the scholarships that I hear about or internships and job opportunities as well. And then on my YouTube channel, Invest in Others YouTube channel, I have videos if you want to strengthen your essay writing skills or other key topics here feel free to um, I invite you to subscribe and look for those opportunities and also I have a youth college excellence summit coming up in August it's virtual so it's a day and a half where you'll spend it with me and other experts and I highly encourage you to register whether you are in high school or college because I give away scholarships at my summit. But the beauty is, and I'd give them on the spot that weekend, I have donors and sponsors who actually um, provide me scholarship funds for me to be able to award to students who spend both days, you have to attend both days of my summit to be eligible on that second day for the scholarships. Um, the QR code is on the right and the link is at the bottom um, and it'll be included in the documents. 
but also um i want to i want you to um certainly appreciate the housing opportunities commission academy for hosting this uh, workshop tonight and do know that as you transition from the educational realm to the employment realm from education to employment because that's where it should lead to next or concurrently <clears throat> make sure that you stay tuned for their upcoming workshops um, this Saturday I will be back so if you want to join or you want to figure out how to strengthen your resume itself or your scholar profile but we're going to focus on resume for professional purposes <clears throat> and search for jobs please join me at um, this Saturday's virtual workshop. And the registration information, um, it's the same one you use to register for. The link is the same for this workshop. So with that being said, thank you so much. I know I'm two minutes over my time, but I hope you found the information that I shared to be useful in different ways, whether you directly now or others in your life or your circle that you think could benefit from it. And are there any final questions that I did not answer, any burning questions that you'd like for me to address now? If not, I hope to see you on Saturday at the next one. Thank you so much. This is Nakia. You're welcome, Nakia. And thank you, Ms. Benita. I saw your note in the chat. Thank you too. You're welcome. Um, well, thank you. I'll see you on Saturday. All right. Thank you. See you all. Um, best of luck to you and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. I have a quick question. I was trying to get off mute. Sorry. Um, I wanted to um, ask you about non-traditional scholarships. Um, are they searched for in the same manner, um, same search engines, or are they different, like, you know, as far as searching and looking for them? Um, you can start with a Google search for non-traditional. If you have more specific examples of non-traditional you're considering or interested in, but if you, the quickest way that I found is to use a Google search and put whatever's non-traditional about it in, in, in quotations. That's okay. one way. Um, also there's a number of different scholarship portals, um, and, and websites that will, um, compile a lot of scholarships and give you the ability to go and filter and do a search within their portal and look for scholarships that way. Um, another source of non-traditional scholarships in my mind would be professional organizations. Let's say if you're an engineer, do you know every profession has professional um, affiliate organizations like the National Society of Business Professionals or Dentist or National, you know, blah, blah, blah those all have philanthropic and funding sources because they're really looking to find people who are interested in their profession. So you can search by, be creative and put in quotes those unique things about it that make it non-traditional and just get to looking. Google's gonna spit out some of the top things. And if you put the year in, like I mentioned, 2024, you'll weed out old scholarships. Great, thank you so much for that, I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Really quickly, so please do not forget to complete the uh, program participation sheet. When you when you complete that form, one, it, it gives us, it lets us know that you were in attendance for this evening's uh, webinar. And secondly, you, you uh, once you complete that, you enter in a chance to win the workbook and textbook from tonight's workshop. All right, well, thank you, Ms. Waller, for allowing me the opportunity to share with your residents. And I look forward to Saturday's event and best of luck. I will make sure that I get those resources out and also this presentation to um, support. But also, if y'all have any questions, I'm going to um, drop my email address in the chat. And if you have any questions, about anything I've shared, please reach out to me and I'm happy to answer any other questions you have. So with that being said, have a phenomenal evening and best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.